blood, but not a lot. I think I can see better without my glasses. My bifocals and I don't get along, so it's much easier just take the glasses off. So we're going to go ahead and start today. And I'm going to start, those of you that know, back in the 19 teens and 20s, whenever there was a catastrophe, all these books would get published within like two or three months. This one is called uh, Our National Calamity of Fire, Flood, and Tornado, Thrilling Stories with Photographs and Sketches by a man by the name of Logan Marshall. And it is the story of the 1913 flood. And I've got four or five of these books that I've collected at home. But I just thought, let's set the mood, set the time, and go to his description of what happened in Hamilton. He said, of all the cities of the Miami Valley, with the exception of Dayton, Hamilton was the hardest hit. Many persons killed, a thousand houses wrecked by the rushing torrent, and 15,000 homeless was the toll of the flood in this city and environs. And the harrowing scenes attending flood disasters in past decades faded into insignificance when it compares to the havoc wrought by the latest deluge. Before, the, before darkness blotted out the scene on March 25th, house after house with the occupants clinging to the roofs and screaming for help floated on the breast of the flood. The cries for help had to go unanswered because of the lack of boats. What little rescue work there was was accomplished uh, before night came on as the rescuers were powerless after darkness. The victims of the raging waters were caught like rats in a trap. So fast did the flood pour in on them, and a few had even a fight had even a fighting chance for their lives. Ghastly in the extreme was the situation. The cries of women and children as they faced the inevitable death, and the frantic but unsuccessful efforts of their husbands and fathers to rescue loved ones presented a scene that will go down in history of the world's catastrophes as one of the worst on records. <laughs> So that's quite an opening for what they have to say about Hamilton. So just a little bit of a review. This storm starts on Easter Sunday, March 23rd, 1913. It's going to start in Omaha, Nebraska, where a tornado is going to level Omaha. And to date, it is still the worst tornado that they ever had in Omaha, Nebraska. They had a death toll of 154. Then the storm is going to move across the Great Plains with tornadoes in Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, Arkansas, and Indiana. So now, what happens here in Hamilton? The rains come down. Friday the 21st, the first storm arrives with strong winds, temperatures 60 degrees. Uh, the next day, uh, gets sunny. Then the second storm comes along and the temperatures are going to drop below freezing. The ground freezes. Easter Sunday, we get the third storm that brings right into the entire valley. Monday, the 24th, 7 a.m., after eight to 11 inches of rain falling the Great Miami River Valley, the floods are going to begin. So how much rain did we get? Here's the chart. We start, and you can see that uh, on the 23rd, the water depth of the Great Miami here in Hamilton is three feet. And you go there by uh, the 26th, that is the record today uh, for flood level, 34.6 feet of water here in Hamilton. That was the uh, highest that the flood water got. And so you can see why we had the flooding. And what is, uh, how much rain did we get and came in? They're estimating 4 trillion gallons of water. That's equal to a 30 day flow over the Niagara Falls is what came through Hamilton in the Miami Valley. So it was pretty intense. So we're gonna kind of go through this by day. And we know that uh, this is probably one of the most famous flood pictures, poor old Dobbin. And those of you that know the story, he was blind and he actually makes it to the courthouse alive and rides the flood out with the uh, horses from the fire stations in Hamilton inside the courthouse. But that's another story for another day. So let's start with Run for the Hills. Nine o'clock in the morning, the kids are coming back to school after Easter. And by nine o'clock, the water is starting to pour over the northern section of Hamilton. And the schools are dismissed when a telegram is received that a dam broke in Dayton and there's a wall of water coming down the Great Miami. 
Nobody stopped to think there was no dams in Dayton. But thankfully, they sent the kids home. They said, don't spend any time, go straight home and tell everybody that you see to run for the hills. And it's thanks to these kids going through and spreading the word that the death toll in Hamilton wasn't worse than what it was. So by 10 o'clock in the morning, the bridges are going to be closing here in Hamilton due the, to the high water. So let's start with our, um, whoops, I think I missed pick a slide there. Okay, anyway. So let's start with our first hand account, Elizabeth Hensley Hand. She lived on the west side of the river and her husband worked for the Hamilton Evening News on the east side. And so this is her account of the flood. She said on one day in March 1913, a vicious flood arrived out of the blue. There was no warning. Before we knew what was wrong, the whistles from the factory were screaming, the fire bells were ringing and people were shouting, run for the hills. My school, Adam, Adams Elementary was surrounded by water and we were sloshing around when the teachers told us to go straight home. I remember seeing houses floating down the river with people on the roofs waving, waving white sheets for help. Some of the houses hit the bridge and shattered. Horses were floating downstream trying to swim, but drowned it too. So now we're gonna move on to Pauline Getz Antonin. This is Ann Antonin's mother-in-law. We just literally got this story in after Ann's death. Uh, it came in some of the early paperwork that has come from her estate to us. And at the time she was living in the fourth ward here in Hamilton. She said, when my sister and I arrived at Hamilton High School, we were told to go home because of an impending flood. We believed it when we saw water trick trickling down gutters on East Avenue. As we entered our fourth ward yard, my father dismissed from work was coming in the back gate. I was glad to see him. Soon the water was filling the yard and pouring down the back cellar steps, extinguishing the furnace. Before the water came into the downstairs, my parents began carrying things upstairs. It included the sewing machine. So you know what they felt was important. And it says, we stayed in bed to keep warm. We couldn't resist going to the front windows to see dead horses, dogs, barns, lumbers, outhouses floating by. So we all well know the story of the bridges. The first one to go is the Black Bridge is going to go at 1212. Apparently nobody was watching the bridge because no stories, no pictures, nothing. But uh, the next one to go now is going to be the Great uh, Main Street Bridge. This picture was taken supposedly 10 minutes before the collapse. Now we have a young gentleman that we're going to be coming back and forth to quite frequently. His name is Robert S. Henninger. He lived at 537 Ross Avenue. He's 15 years old at the time of the flood. That is him on the far right in the picture. The gentleman, second one from the left, is his brother Fontaine, who was a student at uh, 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 Ohio University. And he is going to write its almost a 17 page letter to his brother describing what went on in Hamilton. So we're gonna keep coming back to him. But we'll start with him. Uh, and his story starts at Hamilton High. He's dismissed at, at 9.30. And they are told, if you live on the uh, other side, run quick because the bridge is getting ready to be closed. And he says, we all rushed pell-mell to the bridge, which was already roped off, but we ducked under and ran across. The river had risen to the bottom of the bridge and huge ocean-like waves were thundering against it. Next slide. A great crowd was gathered on both sides of the river. Huge logs and other debris of all kinds rushed with a roar and a terrible thumping under the bridge. The, slate, the waves were simply immense. I took up a position in front of the Star Printing Company. Suddenly someone cried, the bridge. The massive steel structure trembled, appeared to move down the river and then collapsed as if it were a mere pasteboard. The wires on B Street fell and on top of the, on, on top a pole snapped off. The moment the bridge had gone, it was replaced with huge yellow waves. The rain continued to pour down. A Street was flooded on both sides. We stood on the levee with water wrap, lapping at our feet. We have another young man, his name's J. Walter Wack. He was a freshman at Hamilton High and he lived on Court Street. This is his story. He said, I watched all this from the water's edge on High Street until the police ordered us all back as the bridge buckled and the trolley wires began to break. I was near the photographer who was taking pictures when the bridge went down. I always told everyone that I was the kid behind the man on the picture. 
All I know is that everybody sure ran like H to escape the dropping trolley wires, and I don't know whether I ran in front of the camera or not. Now I have another story. Her name's Mrs. Howard Slutes. She was 11 years old at the time of the flood, and she said there was a crowd of people well back from the bridge. We stood just behind a man getting ready to take a picture, so we watched him adjust the black cloth over his head and over the camera. Suddenly there was a cracking noise. We couldn't move. Then fire ran along the wires above us and the bridge began to cave in. So interesting stories there. So let's now move on to the third group. We're gonna go back to Robert Henninger again. This kid was all over, believe me. 17 page letter, you believe he was all over the place. Uh, he says the river, well, first of all, the railroad uh, had put 22 cars of coal on the bridge, hoping that it would weight the bridge down so that the bridge wouldn't collapse. And this is what he says, the river rushed and roared against the railroad bridge. The railroad company had run about 30 cars of coal out on the bridge to weigh it down. The scene was very impressive and terrible. Houses, sheds, and boxcars floated down and were crushed at the bridge. A large barn lurched over and started downward. Rupp's slaughterhouse went afloat and broke in two. A large house at the east end of the Columbia Bridge floated away. Suddenly there was a terrific roar. I caught a glimpse of the cast iron span on the bridge and in a moment it was gone. Huge piles of lumber were loosened and floated to the Columbia Bridge and succeeded in going under. I then went to North Sea Street and got in a good position at the rear of the yard. As far as I could see was water. House after house floated by. Boxcars floated swiftly down B Street, striking telephone poles and snapping them off like weeds. $40,000 worth of lumber floated out from Cullen and Vaughn Yards. So that's the story of that bridge. Yes, Robert makes it across the bridge, yes. Okay, now the Columbia Street Bridge, nobody got to witness it because it goes down at 2.15 in the morning. Um, and it goes down when the Coliseum, which was a big sports and entertainment venue that was on the west side of Hamilton, got up and crashed against the Columbia Bridge. And that was the end of the Columbia Bridge. So we're going to go now move on to stories of the people the first day of the flood. And Alta Heiser, even though she wasn't alive during the flood, wrote and gathered a lot of these stories and published them in 1943. So that's where a lot of these, some of these stories are going to come from the stuff that Alta Heiser collected. And the story that she's going to tell is of John M. Dealer. And he was with the First National Bank in Hamilton, goes on to become the uh, president of the bank. And he said on the morning of March 25th, he came to work as usual in his auto, the kind you had to crank. When the bank force saw that the water was creeping up to the building and preparing they prepared to move out. Mr. Beeler's auto refused to be cranked. Clarence Clawson volunteered to see what he could do with it, promising to take it to a safe location if he could get it started. This he did and drove the car to South Third Street along the Heyman Fisher store. Then he went back for his own horse and buggy. Well, turn a horse loose in an unfamiliar neighborhood and it will find a way home or to something accustomed, an accustomed stopping place. When the floodwaters rose higher and higher, the auto took fright and made a beeline for Frank McGuire's cafe on Court Street. It did not even stop at the curb, but barged through the door and settled in the shadow of the bar. So, see, not all these stories are gloom or doom. Um, Daisy Hancock Shellhouse. She was married in 1912 to uh, George, and they were living on South A Street, just a short distance from the Columbia Street Bridge. She says, not until you've experienced it can you know what five feet of water will do to your home. I decided to carry some of our possessions upstairs. First of all, I took a large framed picture of my dear mother. I worked steadily carrying books and light furnishings. My husband came home and helped. We worked until the flood had carried away our fences and sister and pump. Then my husband said, it's time we get out. I threw a few things into a suitcase and with me on his back, my husband swam to higher ground at the back of our house. Yeah. These stories, I mean, this is giving you an idea of what these people went through. Now, this is one that Alta Heiser wrote, and it's about Al Alpharetta Sheehan. She is in the 100 block of North 2nd Street. She says, I'm daunted by the fierce struggle, struggle of the flood 
of unbelievable magnitude, she went to work to get her house in order, preparing for whatever the flood might bring. She soon was driven to the second floor. Unmindful of the cold and rain, she stationed herself at an open window with a broom. With its help, she hoped to retrieve some of her precious possessions as they were washed through the broken lower windows and bobbed to the surface. One by one, Mrs. Sheehan saw her books washed away. Finally, she succeeded in drawing one of them in within her reach. She grasped it and tried and looked at its title. We may imagine the shock it must have caused when she found it was the story of the Johnstown flood. The book followed the others after all as she threw it into the raging stream with all of her strength. Yeah, Rich. I don't know. I didn't look to see what, what her background was. Okay, the next person we're going to talk to is actually the Barnhouse people. Uh, Maria, Marie Zhang is going to marry Carl Barnhouse. So we got the two stories together here. Marie at the time was 14 year old, uh, years old and lived at 875 North 2nd Street. She said, my father opened the cellar door so the water would run through the house and not push it off the foundation. When the water came up to the second floor, Pop punched a hole in the ceiling and we climbed up and sat in the rafters. He took the doors off and put them there so we wouldn't fall through. There was about eight inches of water on the second floor. The noise of the rain on the roof was terrible because we knew no one could help. Pop hung out the window on the second floor to kick the logs away from the house so that they wouldn't build up and knock our house off the foundation. One thing I have discovered and I'm not an engineer, but the stories where the people say they either opened the first floor doors or opened the cellar doors, those are the houses that did not get washed away. And so I don't know if that's true, but that seems to be the pattern when you see this with the houses. And I'm thinking it's got to be like they say with tornadoes to open the window to equalize the pressure. And then they say, don't do that because you're going to be killed because the tornado will get you. But you know, I'm, I'm from Illinois, and we always were told the tornado was coming, you open the windows to equalize the pressure so your house doesn't blow up. So I'm guessing it's something like that. So this is her husband. That's actually the couple in um, older age. And his question, or his story is really interesting. Um, we know that there were several hundred people marooned at the courthouse without food or water for several days, including the horses. Uh, many of these people were people gone downtown sightseeing to see the bridge collapse and then couldn't get home. Well, Carl Barnhouse was 17 years old, worked for Herring Hall Marvin Safe Company. Here's his story. We were standing at the Rialto Theater. We watched as the water came up. Houses with entire families on them came down the river. The lights were still on inside them. They were kerosene lanterns as they floated down the river. He and his friend Barney Stone got trapped, like I said, downtown and rode off the flood in the courthouse. He said, I wasn't worried about being in the courthouse as I thought it was the highest place in Hamilton. The water got near the top of the lampposts, but didn't get into the first floor of the courthouse. And then he finishes, the dumbest thing I ever did was to go to see the flood. <laughs> okay, Wesley R. Riley, a Mosler employee. His comments were, it was easy to hear the cries for help from people who were clinging to the houses that were drifting in the water. Others had managed to get into trees of peck sedition and were calling out for help at the top of their voices. Because it was getting cold all the, um, all the time, it was feared that they could not hold out until morning when it'd be light enough to get them. It was an experience I would not want to live through again, but one which I will always remember. Ruby Parrish Knox was a child. She lived on the first house on Hanover Street. She says, I remember a man with hip boots came to the house and carried me to a truck parked on higher ground. The house was swept away six hours later and my mother, grandparents and brother were drowned. Only one of my brothers survived and each of us thought the other was dead. Some friends took him in. It was several weeks before, before each other was found out that the other was alive. I won't forget the screams of the people waiting for someone to help them. It was one loud chorus. The next morning, when the worst was over, it was quiet. Now, this is the one story that I have outside of Hamilton, because like I said, I don't like all of these being totally doom and groom. Uh, do not know the family name, but uh, this ran in the Republican News on April 14th, 1913. 
And it said, one of the most unusual experiences in the recent flood was that a family in a farmhouse along the river near Venice. And this is what they had to say. When the water was running, was fast coming up, two cows, a horse and a mule were led into the kitchen. The water cont continued to flood the house. One of the cows, especially known as Aunt Tibby's cow, was led to the stairs to the second story and there where the family had taken refuge. And for 48 hours thereafter, the people lived on the milk furnished by Aunt Tibby's cow. The horse, the mule, and the other cow in the kitchen were drowned. So going back to Alter Heiser now, again, the story that she collected, this is at the William Seward House home located at 84 High Street. Um, and he was a baker and the baker's delivery boy was caught by the floodwaters and he and his house are gonna take refuge on the terrace of the Seward's home. From the yard, they came onto the porch and then into the house. The horse was tied to the stair railing to keep it from doing more damage than could be helped. The house stood quite high from the street, but the water came up. Not having a supply of, it was only four feet in the house. Not having a supply of horse feet, family did not know what to give the hungry guest. They had quite a few apples for it and tried to give it quinine to keep it well. Then when they went to the attic, they took the straw from the matting from the floor and the horse ate all of it. During the night, they pinned a comforter around its shoulders to keep it warm. The baker gave the boy five dollars for saving his horse. The Sewards, unfortunately, neglected to send a bill for the boarding and doctoring of the horse and were not paid. So to do a story of the Benning Hoffman house here, this is Joetta Miller. She was the live-in housekeeper with Polly and Carrie and Peter Benning Hoffman. Uh, Peter is in Europe at the time of the 1913 flood. And Peter Benning Hoffman, and I have not got a clue why, had pet pheasants and they were outside. When the water start to rise, Joetta goes out to the garage and I guess the pheasants were in some sort of cage. She grabs the pheasants, runs them through the house of the Benning Hoffman and they are gonna ride out the flood of the attic of the house. Peter, of course, has sent a telegram to where he was in Europe. And the story goes, um, the sisters say, Joetta saved your pheasants. And the lavalier watch that is around her neck in this picture is the thank you that Peter brought to her from Europe for saving his pet pheasants. So since we're talking about the Benninghoffens, we're gonna talk about Elsa Benninghoff. She is Christian Benninghoffen's daughter and she lives uh, on Dayton Street. And she is going to be popping in and out of here uh, quite frequently. Now, Chris, do I have the right, is that Elsa in the picture? In the middle, that's what I thought. That's Christian Benninghoffen and his wife, and that's Elsa the picture. I thought I'd pick the right picture. Okay, she is Tuesday. I'm writing this account of the most dreadful flood in our town's history. On Sunday, water began coming in the house, March 11, at 11 in the morning. Papa and Mama were here at one with two washwomen. Water one foot from the second story. Wednesday, spent a most dreadful night in the attic with a raging torrent passing by Buildings crashing into the porch, uh, fire was dreadful. Water began receding at 4.30, very cold today and no help. We'll come back to Elsa. This is Charles Keeling. He was a dentist on North 3rd Street. And what's interesting is the picture frame there is the, the Hamilton Journal and the, um, or, the Hamilton uh, Journal News, Evening News and the Daily Republican go together to publish a newspaper during the flood. And the only paper they had was butcher's paper. So this is like wax paper. And so he is going to write a letter to one of his relatives on the back of this picture. And so we're gonna come back to him, but I'm gonna start a story. It says, I suppose you've seen by the papers of our flood, but they do not tell you half the tale. And now after a week, I cannot realize what we've gone through. You will, I'm afraid, think it's a fairy tale. We have been having very heavy rains for several days. Thursday morning, March 25th, I went to the office as usual. About 9.30, Ella, which is his wife, telephoned me that the water was showing around the mill, which you will remember is just in the back of us. I still do not think it was serious. At 10, I came home just to see how things look. We got word about noon to draw some water. Soon we turned it off, also turned gas off. We lit grocery candles. 
About that time, they came after Ella to go over and sit with Mrs. Milliken, who was sick of bed, while Tom ran an errand. He did not get back, so there Ella, Ella stayed, expecting Mrs. Milliken to die at any time. I got the rugs, chairs, and tables moved upstairs. About this time, the water was coming fast. Men and women were standing on our porch, and I sent them over, one of them over, to help carry Mrs. Milliken upstairs. He got there just in time. Ella waited in water up to her knees to reach the stairways. At 1.15 that night, the water reached the top, which was within a foot of our ceiling. It hung there for about two hours and then so slowly declined. We'll come back to him. Let's talk about Ludi Gard. She is the wife of Homer Gard, the editor of the Hamilton Evening News. She was living at that time at 220 Ross Avenue, which was one block south of Maine between C and D. These letters are written to her sister, Ludi Mathias. And she says, Tuesday, March 25th. Of course, we never went to bed. The water was over halfway up our cellar. We moved everything upstairs. Oh, the agony wondering what, what was gonna become of us. With fire and water, you never, never know. Another one of my favorite characters is Jake Keller. And he's going to write to his sisters uh, that lived in Fostoria, Ohio. These letters were written on the backs of four Hamilton machine tool stockroom requisition slips and were not dated, but that's where he worked. So he says, sisters, just a word to let you know that we still are among the living. We went through an awful flood on Tuesday and when it was time to go to work, it poured down raining so hard, I waited and was late for work. I first went down the river. It was raising about six inches an hour. By eight o'clock, the water was coming up Third Street. Some of the boys went home then. By nine o'clock, the, the boss notified all of those living across the river to go home for they were going to close the bridges. At 9.30, we all beat it out of the shop to see the sights. I got home at 12 and started to go uptown again, but I had to stop at the depot for there was water all around. I went home and told the folks to stay close by in case the water came near us, which it did within three quarters of an hour. You ought to have seen the water coming down Ludlow Street from the railroad, Ludlow from East Avenue, and the worst down 8th Street from Maple Avenue. You can guess how fast it came. People walked from our corner to 7th and had to run back again. We'll come back to Jacob. Anson Lukens was a reporter for the Hamilton Evening Journal, was caught at home with his mother and his sisters. It says, from our back windows, we saw houses on Chestnut Street go to pieces, tearing away as much of the protection of our house. Every shed west of Front Street from Wood Street South has left for parts unknown. We lay there awaiting the end and counted the hours. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. With each hour, the storm increased until all hope was abandoned to ever escape alive. To one never having the experience, they will never realize the danger of the feeling. For hours, we prayed to God to stop punishing the stricken city. And then it came one o'clock. The storm still held full sway. Next came two, and the water slowly crept up our steps. Then three, four, and five. And with five o'clock came daylight, a rough river, but let up in the storm. As Wednesday, Wednesday progressed, we could see the river fall an inch an hour, perhaps the start, but it sent a ray of hope over us. Now, this is the story that really gets to me. Um, this is a letter written by Anna Ziegler. She is the wife of the pastor at Emanuel Lutheran Church on Front Street. Her husband is at a pastoral convention in Indiana and is not home. She is home with all of her children and they are going to spend the night in the unfinished attic of the parsonage. And the water is going to reach the ceiling of the first floor during the night. And she is convinced that she and the family are not going to survive. So she is going to write two goodbye letters, one to her husband and one to her parents. These are the letters. My dearest parents, we are all in danger of dying. Everything is flooded. We are upstairs in the study. Below, everything is underwater and soon will reach us since we only have two steps remaining. I do not believe that we will come through this alive. We have put ourselves in God's hands. It is now four o'clock. The water is still rising. It is raining and storming. We can only pray. 
He said, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. He is our refuge. Yes, he called us to himself. In this world, you will have troubles, but be cheerful. I have overcome the world. He surely can overcome all the storm and stress for certain. We will see each other again in heaven. It pains me so on account of God, that is her husband. He left for a conference and knows nothing of our difficulty. His sorrow will be great when he returns and never sees us again. God must comfort him. He was always so thoughtful. May God reward him for everything. Also, dear parents and sisters, many thanks for everything you did for us. I can write no more until we see each other in heaven, Anna. Now here's the letter that she's gonna to send to her parents. Thanks, it says, my dearest pop, well, this is what she's sending, I'm sorry, to her husband. Should I never see you again, you should take these lines as a loving goodbye. Oh, my dearest, it hurts me so to think that you may come home and never find us. For I believe we may not see each other again in this life. The flood is nearly to the top step and is rising. It is terribly cold in the house. My dearest, we put ourselves in God's hands. We will pray and sing. I am wholly submissive to God's will. Only the children whimper loudly. They sing only hymns of trust and of the cross as I write this. One other thing I ask of God is that he would keep us together. We are all up in your study. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So I spoke to you that you might have joy in me. In the world you have tribulation, but be comforted. I have overcome the world. The strong champion that overcame the world can also overcome raging waves and high waters. He who rules the storm and wind can command these floodwaters. Thank you, dearest one, for the love and kindness you always showed me. You were always thoughtful and caring. For over two hours, Mr. Schaefer has been in the tree just across from us and cannot get away. He wants to swim to German's roof. Oh, just now he was washed away. Only one more step and the water is up to us. We must go higher. God be with us all, Anna. Now, I will tell you the rest of the story. Her daughter preserved these letters. The water stops right at the last step. And it is those of you that know Mike Dingledine, this is his grandparents. And they were right over here on Front Street. So, but that really gives you an idea of what the people were going through. So we're gonna move now to day two. Oops. And the rumors that are now circulating on day two. The water's going to crest 2.15 in the morning at 34.6 feet. The previous record had been 23.9 feet set in 1898. And how wide was the river? Think about it. Erie Parkway, Route 4, to the, to the east, and C and D Street to the west well over uh, three miles wide here in the city. So and why does it stop at Route 4? That was the old Miami Erie Canal. And if you know, as you drive up Route 4, it goes like this, you're going up the banks of the canal. That's what stopped the water at Route 4. So let's go through, here's the Lane Library. Um, there, the loss at the Lane Library was estimated $48,000. In today's term, that's over $1 million. Uh, they lost most of their papers, most of their books, and it took them 18 months to reopen after the flood because they actually had a wall of the building collapse and everything else. Here is a map of Hamilton. You can see by wards and everything that is in the dark gray is what was underwater during the 1913 flood. Uh, so, and like I said, Lindenwald area, because they are east of Route 4, was spared. And as was the Mosler Safe Company. The Mosler Safe Company is going to become the trauma ward. That is where the troops are going to come up, where they're going to take people that are injured. They're going to set up the hospital, feed the people on the east side. Uh, and that is going to be the role of Mosler Safe Company during the flood. So let's go back now to Alta Heiser. She has a story about the J.A. Hefting family. They, their house was at Second and Black which is basically what that picture is right there. That is the intersection of second and black. And it says, from the roof of their drifting doomed house, they succeeded in getting onto the cranes in Niles Tool Yard. That is the cranes at Niles Tool Works in the picture. And it said, here they clung for two days 
in a cold rain without food or water. If anyone welcomed the light from the burning champion, it must have been these people. Notwithstanding the added terror, they could at least see each other. It was almost beyond one's power to conjecture what must have been their condition when they were rescued on March 27th. Now, what was the rumor? Well, a report was received that the uh, dam at Lewiston had broke and even a greater flood of water was coming down the Great Miami. Uh, a telegram was received at the McGonagall Telegraph office and it said prepare for another flood. People on the west side of Hamilton, uh, they will talk about how they got the message, but they're all going to try to flee up Wilson's Half Hill and Heitzman's Hill uh, where they thought they would be safe. Again, the warning was passed person to person. Now let's talk about the warning. The actual telegram was sent to McGonagall and received on Tuesday, the first day of the flood. We are now on the second day of the flood. And the telegraph person was able to get this telegraph through to Hamilton before the telegraph wires went down. Well, he gets done with his time of duty, leaves the telegram laying on his desk. The next day, the other telegram operator is going to come in, see this telegram, and think, oh my gosh, there's another flood coming. The telegraph wires are down. So he is going to ride a horse into Hamilton to deliver the warning. This is the rumor that comes. So this is how the rumor starts. And it's interesting. We're going to get and talk a lot about champion paper here in a minute. I found going through the champion paper logs about a 40 page story of champion in the flood. And that's where this came from. But uh, let's go back to Ludy Gard for a minute. She's going to say, we came up to Addis the next night and just got into bed when word came that a rush of water was coming, a rise of 30 feet. Few stopped to think that it was impossible and grabbed everything and hiked through the hills. We had two dress cases, a black bag with money, mostly in silver, Sunday school money, my bag of silver, and the dog. Can you imagine how we carried it all and got there alive? It passed as a false alarm. We stayed until daylight and came home in a serious storm. But when night comes, it is hell, just on the watch for something, and every noise makes you jump. Oh, if I could only describe it to you so you could see our desolation. I feel as if death would have been better, for what is ahead of us seems to be impossible. If St. Francis arose, so can we. But what a struggle. So we're going to go back to Elizabeth Hensley Hand now. She's going to say on the second night, the state militia arrived on horseback with bullhorns shouting for us to leave our homes, that a 40-foot rise like a tidal wave was on the way. The March winds, the snow, the cold, and the fear made it difficult to walk three miles to higher ground. There were hordes of people and children, lots crying, and the neighbors helping each other. The night was pitch black, and it was pretty terrible. The farmers on the hill let us stay in their warm homes. I can remember sitting on a stairway, adults praying and children screaming. I was so scared and numb with fear. I was only eight years old. Where was my father? Was my home now gone? Were my pets alive? And was my father alive? At daybreak, news arrived. The 40-foot rise had not come and the waters were receding. The flood was over. Our home was safe. Several days later, I was sent back to school. Still no news of my father. When I came home that day, my mother said, Elizabeth, come into the parlor. Someone wants to see you. So I did, and there sat a creature with hair all over his face, dirty and wet, and he said, don't you know me? Papa had come home. He had gone down to the river to watch his best friend get in a boat that capsized halfway across. My father had decided to walk north to New Miami to see if he could get across there. Now, this one is coming to us from uh, uh, the letters of Ludy Gard. And it's the story of the George Zeke family that she's going to send to her sister. She says, a man came into Dr. Milliken's office with a little girl. The doctor asked, where are the rest of your family? He says, this is all I have left. I've dug four out of the gravel, but have not found my wife yet. And you can see the picture of their house there. Um, they were on Dayton, uh, on Lowell Street, a street that ran northwards from Dayton between 4th and 5th. And that's their house right behind the small tree there. Um, Zeke and his wife, Mary, had five children. They had stayed in the house in the attic until it was pushed off its foundations. 
Mrs. Zeke and four of the children climbed onto the roof but were washed away as the house swayed and rolled in the current. George and daughter Pearl stayed in the attic and were able to crawl to an attic of another house where they waited for the water to subside. They were the only survivors of the family. This is Ruth Vinmeister. She is eight years old. And after the flood, when they went back to school, as all girl school teachers would say, write the story of the flood. And this is what she wrote to, in her second grade class at Jackson School. Miss Bertha Rich was her teacher. She said, Mama and Papa and I were in bed. Some men on horses rode by saying, 30 feet rise fly to the hills. It was quarter after 12. We hurried and dressed. We all had some new baby chicks, and Papa did not like to leave them. And Uno the dog went with us, and we ran two miles and went in the barn. We had hay all over us. And as you can see, Uncle, as you could see, all you could see was Uno's head out of the hay. And it was snowing so hard. And the people kept saying that the water was coming. I got so cold that Mama took me in the house. And in the morning, they said the water was not coming. And I was so glad it did not come. Mama went and picked up Papa's pants, and all his money fell out on the floor. We did not take time to pick it up. And Mama took a loaf of bread. So we, if we got hungry, we'd have something to eat. Doesn't that sound like a second grader? Yes. So now we're going to move on to Champion. As we know, Champion is going to end up burning. But we're going to start first with a, Charlie, a story by Charlie Soul. Um, and he is in, working in the coating mill. And if I'm right, he is one of the legends of Champion. Um, they've got a whole series of books on people of Champion, and he's one of them that they keep bringing up. This guy was there for like ever. Anyway, he had reported for work at six in the morning, but by nine, the flood waters were beginning to pour into Champion. Water went to the boiler room and took out Champion's power. People were sent home. In the coating mill, 15 to 20 people stayed to try to remove the belts and save them from the water. They continued to work until sometime between two and three, when the water was almost up to their armpits. Charlie remembered that he had $20 in his locker in the real room and went and put the water up to his shoulders and retrieved it. Then the 15 to 20 people left, couldn't figure a way out. They found that their only safe exit was through a skylight in the coating mill across the roof of the coating mill to the west where there was a connecting link with the paper mill on the south, then to the roof of the old wall warehouse. By that time, the entire mill was surrounded by water and they had to jump from the warehouse roof on the western side of the mill to the hillside over a raging stream of eight to 10 feet deep water. Another group is going to be trapped in mill number two, which is the building between the river and B Street. It is completely surrounded by water. They moved to the second floor of the mill using an electric cables that ran across B, a rope and a board, and a a uh, pulley swing was devised, and one by one, the men were cut, pulled across B Street. Homer Ferguson, who was then in charge of the furnishing room in the number two mill, was the last champion pulled to safety. So now we're going to move on to Clarence Bartlett. He is a steam fitter at Champion. He said it was difficult to remember anything but water. There was water everywhere you looked. The mill was completely surrounded. Everything was flooded. And it certainly was a strange feeling that night to stand on a hillside watching the flames eat away part of the mill and still unable to do anything about it. There was only one piece of fire equipment on the west side, a hose wagon designed to only carry hoses. That day, Oxford is going to send down a pumper that uh, volunteers pump water onto the fire. Unfortunately, the pumping of the dirty, muddy water damaged the equipment, ending an attempt to put out the fire. Picture water everywhere, nowhere to get it on the flames. By Thursday, the water was dropping, the fire threatening mill number one. A bucket brigade was tried, but made no dent on the fire. The only hope was a fire pump in Champion located in a small building at the east end of the boiler room, about 30 feet from B Street. There was still about two feet of water in B, in B and the pump house floor was six to eight feet lower. The water would have receded far enough to build a fire in the champion boilers to provide steam for the pump. Charlie Soul, again, he's, like I said, he shows up in so many of these stories, volunteered to try to attach a fire hose to the submerged pump. Submerged pump. It took several attempts, but he was successful around 3 p.m. and water began pumping. 
Around dark, the fire was brought under control and mail one was saved, although the coding mill was lost. So let's go back now to J. Walter Wack. Um, he is going to say that the champion fire, this lit up the whole sky and scared everyone. If anyone could have been more scared than they already were. We knew that the fire was across the river and that on the west side because Fire Chief William Do Doty had taken refuge in the St. Charles Hotel at the corner front and streets. We could see the chief silhouetted against the red sky as he paced back and forth across the roof of the hotel. He did the best he could. He stayed on the roof all night pacing back and forth, but he couldn't get to the fire. So what was the losses of Champion? 1.7 million. Uh, the Hamilton Daily Republican News stated that the greatest sufferer in the Miami Valley from the March flood was the Champion Coated Paper Company of Hamilton. There was rolls of paper and equipment found as far away as Venice. Six inches of mud throughout the facility, losses to Champion, like we said, over a million dollars, but they were back in business by June 11, 1913. And that's because they paid all of their workers throughout this entire time. They said, once you get your families taken care of, come back to work. Uh, they got the boilers back in operation almost immediately. Once the water was out, repairs were made to the generator. They brought their electricity back online and they were able to connect their electricity generating to everyone that lived on the west side of, or the yeah, west side of Hamilton and also water. And so they supplied the people of Rossville water and electricity at no charge until the city was back up in operation. <coughs> so now, as the floodwaters are going to recede, we're going to tell some stories of the cleanup from March 27th and on. Um, first of all, we're going to talk and about, they set up a temporary morgue at the courthouse. Um, and the first hours of search, they found 10 bodies and recovered from the ruins and they put a conservative estimate of the death toll at 50. Well, they started piling up the coffins on uh, the east side of the courthouse. Coffins were awaiting the flood victims. Those bodies were being gathered as ra rapidly as possible. By April 3rd, the city is going to offer a reward of $10 for each body recovered from the debris left by the flood. Up to that time, they only had 71 bodies. Uh, it was believed that many bodies had been swept out of the Miami and on the Ohio River and Pass, where that would be found again. Death toll here in Hamilton? Unknown. Uh, the official death toll, I believe, was 250. When we started researching this back in 2013, we came up with over 400, about 420 names. Now, some of these people that were originally uh, listed as dead, show up on the 1920 census. So we decided they must have survived and just left town. Um, but we don't to this day know. Uh, there's a story of George Rump who owned the slaughter plant and his body is recovered and ends up in a morgue in Cincinnati uh, about six weeks after the flood. The only way they identified him was by the keys in his pocket. So it's very likely that some of the bodies made it all the way to the Ohio River and just continued on down. So we're gonna go back to Emma, uh, to Alta Heiser again. She's gonna tell the story of Emma Schwab. Uh, Schwab. And uh, she was on 10th Street between Campbell Avenue and High Street. And she said, when the family was forced to flee, they left the children's Easter bunny on the second floor. It demonstrated how it felt about such treatment and perhaps appeased its hunger by gnawing book bindings, rugs, and furniture, causing more destruction than anyone could ever imagine one little bunny could do. Needless to say, he survives the flood. Daisy Hancock Shellhouse, returning to her, she says, when we returned to the house, the door of the basement had been forced open. In the sunny dining room, I kept my mending basket. When my husband entered, the basket was lying on the floor in the mud. In it, a mother muskrat had her babies. Frightened, she ran to the only opening and plunged into the water. All of our heaviest furniture was ruined. The flood cannot be blamed, though, for stopping the clock. Perhaps the clock stopped on stopped the flood. The water came just to the position on the stairway where it had been placed as the last item moved. In the third ward, um, 
Alta Heiser is going to tell a story about Dr. and Mrs. Lewis Freckwick. They had a pen of prize black Orpington chickens in their garage. This is 315 North 2nd Street, which I believe is right next door, uh, the Wilkes Insurance. The rooster, and they're in a, a pen in the garage. And the rooster was immense, both in size and his crowing ability. Their pen is going to float down the river. And when the waters began to recede, the old familiar crowing was heard. And so they went down there and led by the clarion call, the doctor and his father started out to find the undaunted cock. The pen was intact and the chickens were none the worse for their journey, except they were undoubtedly very hungry and thirsty. They were claimed and taken home, but the garage had toppled over. There was no place outside for the prize chickens. And telling the story, Mrs. Freckling eventually evidently felt that their problem was solved along the lines of having bats in the belfry. They had chickens in the attic. The summer screen stored their furnished material for an improvised pen. The chickens were warm and dry until permanent quarters could be provided. Let's go back now to Dr. Charles Keeley. He says, our porch is gone. Every window downstairs is broken. Floors working, pianos, books, bookcases, books, pictures on the wall, china closet fell into pieces. Mud uh, is a foot deep on the floors. I cannot describe it. We have the floor cleaned off now, but the harder we work, the more there seems to be done. Aunt Carrie was all down through it, and her beautiful things on first floor are all gone down the river. Will we ever recover? We went right, they, we were right in the current. It came down Buckeye Street. Houses, horses, drift of all kinds struck our house passing on, hauling it away now in great loads. The life loss is fearful, finding bodies all the time. Just think of the 10 feet of water in our house, a raging torrent. They built a bridge over the river. Bridge gave way later that night. Just think of it, Mamie, a solid body of water from 3rd Street where Judy Murphy lives to 10th Street, taking in all the resident sections as well as manufacturing plants. With three feet of water high on, on High Street and down in the second ward, three feet of water in the depot. It has been an awful strain on all of us. So just a couple of short stories from the SD Fitton family. Julia Mitchell is their servant. She says, we never knew what we were going to have to eat until we opened the cans as all the labels were washed off. We cooked our meals over uh, great fires. And Elsa Benninghoffen is going to talk. Friday, walked home with a basket of provisions this morning. Paul has a force of 10 men here from the mill trying to clean the house. Saturday, letter from Gerda in Oxford this morning. She is almost crazy from the off reports she has heard of the flood. Men still shoveling out mud. Sunday, Mrs. Frank Milliken brought us a potato salad and a pie this morning. Are working on the kitchen range now instead of using Paul's grates. Tuesday, awful mess going on. Pulled wallpaper off various rooms. Wednesday, Papa brings home meat from Lindenwald. Thursday, walk downtown through the mud morning, the mud morning rain this afternoon to buy things at Kroger Grocery. Hamilton is an awful scene of destruction. And people were warned, they were concerned about uh, uh, just epidemics, they were told to boil their water, um, martial laws declared, and so things are really bad, even though the floodwaters have gone down. This is the bread line at Central High School. Uh, it's on Ludlow between South Front and uh, South Second Street, and bread lines and distribution centers were common throughout the flood stricken area. Let's go back to Jason Ke Jacob Keller. On Tuesday morning, I left home at five to go see what I could, if I could get some bread somewhere. It took me over an hour to get to Carl's Grocery. Water, boxcar sheds, fence poles, furniture, wagons, trees, anything that could be put in my way was there. Even the soldiers held me up and wanted to know where I was going. But to make a long story short, I had to get something to eat for that bunch of people. Fasting is all right, but there is a limit to it. Three days is enough for anyone. I think I'm making it up for now. I started out with $10 in my pocket, but could not buy a loaf of bread. Get, uh, Gets helped us out as much as they could as they had a house full too. I started out again as soon as I could and got some bread, crackers, and meat and sausage from the soldiers relief station next to the Peerless Foundry. The Smith boys brought us milk, eggs, and chicken. Don't forget to send them a card as they are the ones with goods and it comes when it comes to charity. The Visdome sent us milk, butter, eggs, cakes, salmon, and a can of peaches. Anna, Edna, and Uncle Johnny sent us a large piece of, of side meat. Uncle Mike brought us a large ham, six gallons of milk, 
butter, eggs, and milk, and butter milk. Things have to be given away for because you can't buy anything in the grocery stores. They were all running out. All the grocery keepers are getting in a new supply of goods. Well, yet you cannot buy anything. You can sure all get all you want though from the relief stations. Tell George that at the end of the Columbia shop where he worked, somewhere down on in Pex, the, the shop is somewhere down in Peck's edition. There is a hole to the east and south of the building large enough to bury it in. They have not received any news from Charlie Doc Wright uh, this time. So I am positive he went down the river with the house belonging to his mother-in-law. They found her Tuesday. Tonight's paper says that there are 300 missing and only 75 found, four to five unidentified. Fred Gus Gutwalt Kaler, the cement man, and his bride ground. They were found, but not Fred. Today at court, High Court, 3rd, 2nd, and Market Streets look like Jen Mintz's backyard. Everything placed out on the street to dry, and, it, and what won't dry is being hauled to the dump. John Yergin, our humane officer was marched out of town by the soldiers for stealing hams, so they say. The west side of the city did not get damaged so bad. There are just two houses standing on A Street between Ross and the railroad bridge. On Lower Hamilton Street, 47 houses are missing. Back of Uncle Val's, the YMCA boathouse, John Rentschler Foundry, who and owns Rentschler Pattern Storage uh, Shop, at least eight other houses in that neighborhood are all gone. Only the cisterns are left to show where they had been. Mr. and Mrs. Chatton Chat Snide's new bakery and flat, all the rest of the houses down to the river are gone. The small gas tank on High Street is upset. One third of the houses north of Niles Tool Works are off their foundations or are missing. The Holbrook brothers have a large barn standing in front of their residence on High Street. It seems that like everyone who had an old shed, fence, wagon tree, wash tub, boiler can, tin can, or anything else that was worthless piled up around Dr. Scott's house at 10th and High. It was a sight. Bertha Duhlman postponed her wedding. Her home looks like the shed hit the middle and went right through all the houses down to the next square. So let's get a little bit lighter. Ulta Heiser talks about the Madison Schoolhouse, which faced 9th Street, where the water was the deepest as any place in the city. Because of the rise in the ground and the high foundations, there was no water in any of the rooms, but only the basement flooded. And she reports as the water drained out, someone caught a four pound catfish in the basement of the school. <laughs> J. Walter Wack, he's talking about the traction car that was at 100, 113 Court Street and merchandise from Rat Clips of Drug Store at Second and High as the water's coming down Court Street. Leave it to boys. The water receded slowly, and when we kids woke up on Wednesday morning, we had lots of fun. The pressure of the water and the debris had broken several windows at Ratcliffe's drugstore at South and High Street, and all the merchandise they could float off the store shelves was coming out Second Street, side of the Rentschler building, and following the swift water down Court Street. When it came to the traction car, it swooped over north towards our porch. We got the clothes poles out of the backyard, which was high and only had about six inches of watch, water in it, and we went fishing. We used the poles to drag the loop towards the porch. We fished out all kinds of soap, face powder, and oodles of items that were packed so that their cartons would keep them afloat. Go back to Jacob Keller. He said, ours is one of the 100 pianos in the flood district that was not destroyed. Esther Alford's piano looks like it had the smallpox. Everything is peeling off, even the keys. Mother's piano looks like it had the mumps. It's all shot. Aunt Maggie's uh, piano has got the fever. Anybody who had anything of value on the ground floor had it ruined. We were lucky that way. We passed everything upstairs that could be carried. Our parlor furniture was piled on top of chairs. The old couch was only one thing that got soaked. We piled everything of value on it. Wherever you look, there's a piano laying in the street. They burned three wagon loads yesterday. Six pianos were ruined within 100 feet of our house. Jacob Keller is going to continue. I've received no word from the shop several times to report to work shoveling mud. We had enough work around here to keep the three of us busy, so I started home. I'm going to report for work tomorrow. Those 12 days that I worked at home was worth it, $100. You can get 25 cents to 60 cents per hour uptown cleaning cellars. The mud is like shoemaker's wax. Our house, we had 18 inches of water and mud. Over at the other house, they had about four to five feet. Up at Niles Tool Works, they had about 16 feet. 
My toolbox is destroyed. It took me all morning to get what rust I could off my tools. Sam Greenberg would not give me much for them now. Elsa Benninghoffman is also going to talk about how much they were paying. She said, five cleaning ladies applied to date, engaged them at $2 per day. Men in the cell were getting $4. So despite martial law being declared, uh, a lot of looting was taking place. Soldiers are told, given the orders to shoot to kill, and several people were drummed out of town. Jacob Keller is going to uh, talk about, he says, martial law is martial law. No getting around it. Sundown is bedtime. No one is allowed to go on the streets after 7 o'clock p.m. or before 5.45 a.m. If you get caught, it's halt with a large Winchester looking you in the face. No pleasant greetings at all. The militia came here the day after the flood, and they were from Cincinnati and Hillsboro, Ohio. They were relieved Saturday morning by companies from Toledo. We have some regulars from Fort Thomas here also, and they have in charge of the building of building the pontoon bridge. They are stricter as a rule and a better class of men. The public respects them more than the tenderfeet. Our corner is the meeting place for some of these centuries. So as soon as the word got out to that the flood had happened, a lot of young men at Oxford Miami University volunteered to come help down. They are the ones who are gonna serve as the police now on the Rossville side of the river. Uh, others stayed up in Oxford and the women up in Oxford were gathering reliefs. Uh, supplies to send down here, and the, one of the few trains that could make it through could run between Oxford and the west side of Hamilton, so they were getting supplies into that end. And they're going to build a temporary pontoon bridge uh, so that people can get back together. The bridge was three feet wide, but unfortunately more rain uh, caused it to be closed at times, and finally the bridge is going to be washed away when it's struck by driftwood. And Elsa Benninghoffen is going to come on Friday cold and rainy. Pontoon bridge across the river swept away last night by a three foot wise. So, believe me, we're getting to the end. Becca Paper Mill. Whoops, went too far. Um, Moody Guard is going to comment on Beckett Paper. The flood waters 15 feet in this area, part of the mill uh, collapsed. And according to Ludy Guard, Tom Beckett had an awful hit, $50,000 worth of paper just ready to ship. Mill badly damaged, water eight feet in their house, and two children down with the measles. <laughs> Jacob Keller is going to talk about the west side of the city did not get damaged so bad. There are two houses standing on A Street between Ross and the railroad bridge. On Lower Hamilton Street, 47 houses are missing. Back of Uncle Val's in the YMCA boathouse, John Rentschler filed. Foundry, who owns the Wrenchler Pattern Storage Shop, at least eight houses in the neighborhood are gone. Um, the small gas tank on High Street is upset. One third of the houses north of Niles Tool Works are off their foundations or they are missing. The Holbrook Brothers have not a, have a large barn standing in front of their residence on High Street. It seems like anybody who had an old shed, it ended up in front of Dr. Scott's house. <laughs> so, there is no official death count, like I said, um, but we do know that at least 300 homes were destroyed and another 2,000 houses were so badly damaged they had to be demolished. Uh, roughly one out of three residents were left homeless. Many uh, businesses, factories, merchants, inventories were destroyed or damaged. Both Champion and Beckett Paper had to be rebuilt. Hundreds of horses and many other domesticated livestock died. Acres and acres of farmland were washed away or buried by gravel. But according to Homer Guard, he said, I hope businesses of the city will boom again. I am not depressed or despondent. They can look ahead and see a rainbow coming down on Hamilton. We are going to rebuild Hamilton bigger and better. Thousands of Hamiltonians approached the city's recovery with a positive spirit that was summed up in the words printed on buttons that many of them wore. Grin, gosh darn it, grin. So the cost of the fire, over 600 people died throughout the Miami Valley, that includes uh, Dayton and up to Piqua, uh, nearly 65,000 people displaced, over 20,000 homes destroyed, property damage, over 300 million. That was in those days, that's over $2 billion in today's terms. Uh, approximately 200 bridges, bridges destroyed, hundreds of miles of roads destroyed, thousands of acres of farmland washed away, uh, 1,400 horses, 2,000 other domestic animals are gonna be killed. And so where does this come? 
deadliest and costliest floods in US history. Now notice, number nine is the Great Dayton flood. That's only Dayton. Then for some reason, they singled out the rest of the, the Miami Valley and we come in a 23rd place. So I wonder if they would have combined the two of them where we would have been. But if you look, number 29 is Hurricane Katrina. So we are going to rank above Hurricane Katrina. So that, that tells you how big this flood was. It is still today the number one uh, weather event for the state of Ohio. Um, I always love it when I get people from Cincinnati down and they say, well, what about the flood of 1937? I said, that's kindergarten. <laughs> so you can see uh, how bad this all was. In fact, I don't believe the uh, 1937 flood doesn't even make the top 10 here in Ohio. So that's what I've got. Does anyone have any questions? Or I, before I go, I have a gentleman that wanted to tell one story. Is he still here? Oops, you just don't vote for it. Yeah, I know. So, okay, you want to mind. tell your story? Uh, my father, uh, as a church house, born at 8 o'clock in the morning at Brian Foot, which I think was Kenny Street at that time. And he took him and his mother out on a rowboat. Uh, they couldn't take the horse drawn ambulance downstream because the curbs were dug up. And they took him out to uh, 4th Street or, or 7th Street, I think. And they went into a house, and the house was bombarded by trees floating down there. So they took him out further. Anyway, they ended up on Courthouse Hill. And my grandmother told me, she said, That's what's wrong with your father. They just came the same time for the last three days. <laughs> The, the, those of you that couldn't hear us on the, the, uh, the his father was born the day of the flood, and he was telling the story on how they had to rescue the mother and the child by boat. And she says, well, that's what's wrong with your father. He had to stay in the same diaper for, for three days. <laughs> um, so does anyone, I see some questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the lady said that her grandmother lived in a house behind the Lane Library, and the recording of her story of the flood is on the Culligan website if you'd like to go listen to it. She was seven at the time, when, uh, and it's about a 10 minute recording. Mm -hmm. Rosemary, what? Okay, Rosemary Riker. Okay. Yes, Ed, I see. Yeah, the water level here uh, was about 10 feet at the Benning Hoffman House. If you go into the dining room, the fancy china cabinet that's in there is a survivor of the 1913 flood, and the water level is clearly, you can't see it. And, if this, only if the sun's shining the right way uh, can you see it. And when they put our flood plaque up, the city says, well, we're going by GPS. You know, you can't go by. That's just a mark in the wood. So when they did GPS, it, it's within one eighth of an inch. Of the <laughs> so, so much for the city telling me. Jackie. Yeah. Um, one thing that's not mentioned, the river was not nearly as wide as it is now. Right. Yeah, when the uh, Jackie said the river was not as wide as it is now, but Miami Conservancy District, of course, and in Dayton, the, the saying was, remember the promises were made in the attic. And the Miami Conservancy District was the result of the 1913 flood. They are going to come in and tame the Great Miami River. It has not flooded since. And there's a series now of dams and, and overflows and things like this. They dredged the river uh, through Hamilton. It's much, much wider than what it used to be. Um, and we can thank the Miami Conservancy District for the safety that we now enjoy here in the city of Hamilton. Yes, Jackie. Yeah, there's two markers on the north side of, of the bridge, Main High Bridge, that show you how wide the river was at the time of the flood. Yeah, she says that if you look, there's two markers on the north side of the bridge that show you what the width was at the time of the 1913 flood. So if you haven't gone on down there, it's it's real eye-opening to see. Yeah, to see it. But uh, the markers were put up in 2013, thanks to the blunts. Uh, yes. The retaining wall, all of that was done with the Miami Conservancy District. Am I right on that, Jackie? 
Yeah, the Virginia Miami, Hills. Miami Conservancy <laughs> District was not a government agency. That right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, and it's interesting because they paid off the bonds early on this, and it was not federal money that paid for the project. And like they said, if it was federal money, they'd still be working on it. <laughs> um, but they they did it without federal funding. And that's why we all pay taxes now to the Miami Conservancy District on our property taxes. It was like 1920, wasn't it? Early, early yeah, 20s? They, I think that early in the 20s is when the Conservancy yeah. District is formed. And uh, so that's why if you see on your property taxes, it says Conservancy, Miami Conservancy District, you're paying for the flood control of the Miami River. And it is very successful. Yes, Shirley? Um, they were finished by... I want to say 1938, maybe. Um, that's in one of my other flood talks, and I have looked at that recently. Uh, but I'm thinking it was before World War II that they had the uh, Miami River taken care of. And like I said, we I, I was watching it here about a month ago, and I'm like, okay, Conservancy District. Uh, as we all know, it was getting pretty darn high over here, but it has not flooded. So... <laughs> Right, yeah. There's always been a wrench floor on the Conservancy Board. Question? Yes. Did they dredge out the river or did they bring in dirt to build up the river? They dredged the river. We've got pictures. In fact, my one volunteer said, there's not train tracks along the river on the east side. Well, yes, that's what they were hauling out the, the dredging parts from. There was a temporary track put in. No, they didn't need to bring any dirt in. They had plenty, and like A Street disappears uh, when the river is widened. Of course, most of it was washed away in the flood. Yeah, there was more streets there. And that's what happened to A Street. It disappeared in the 1913 flood. There was an A Street once upon a time. Yes. Yeah, they just found this, I want to say maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was a story in the paper that they found, he said called the truck, well, that's the wheels of one of the railroad cars was just dug out of the river here in the last 10 to 15 years. So they're still finding debris from the 1913 flood. And any of you that have older homes in the area, if you look in your walls, you probably have what we all affectionately call flood mud in your walls, and uh, we still have lots of flood mud here at the Benninghofen. Um, and so if you go in there and go, what is this? Now well, it's flood mud. So what did they do with all the dirt they took? You guys got out of the river. What did they do with all They hauled it away. I don't know where they dumped it, but. Neal and Boulevard. Neal and Boulevard, yeah. So yeah. a lot of it was built to build up the banks and, and you know, make it deeper, yes. And what caused the fire? Okay, according to the champion stuff that I read, they're not 100% sure. They're saying that there was chemicals in the building that could have combusted, but their best guess was is there was a lot of burning houses that were going down the river, and they're thinking that probably a burning house hit the corner of champion and ignited the chemicals that was there, and that's what started the fire. And everything that was above the water level burned. And what was below the water level didn't burn. So that's why when you see the pictures of Champion, you see partial walls still standing. And that's what was below the water level at the time of the fire. Um, they would have kerosene lamps burning in them. Um, if they hadn't turned off their stoves, the heat of the stoves could have caught something on fire. Yeah. There was lots of things that could have caused fires going down the river. So I just can't imagine the terror that these people went through. So do we have any questions online? None? Okay. So there's no more. Yeah, Ed, Ed, okay. There's plenty of cookies and water in the back. And I want to tell you that our next talk is going to be the fourth Thursday in April. And it's going to be the unofficial opening of our quilt exhibit. And um, Mary Royer will be talking on the quilts here in the collection. She is an expert when it comes to quilts. Mm -hmm. And so she knows everything there can be about quilts, the patterns and everything else. Um, so she will be talking about the quilts in our collection. So we ask, invite you to all come back. 
And then the follow, the last program, Rich, he, he's going to do the program and he's still yet to send me a write-up on the program. So Rich, do you want to tell him what you're doing? <laughs> Chemical Chicago, home care, all sorts of things that will go 